Hello, everybody, everybody, hello. Welcome to Copy That's Whetstone Wednesday on a Wednesday. Uh, this is the only uh, Wednesday that happens to also be a Whetstone, or perhaps the only Whetstone that happens to be a Wednesday. Now, what is Whetstone Wednesday? It is the time, the place, the location in planet Earth where uh, the members of Copy That go through and review viewer copy, that is, your copy. One of the things that you need to get better is feedback on your copy. Uh, one of the things that we can do if we are motivated enough and compensated for our time is that, doing that. So what someone wants to say is an opportunity for people to pay to get their copy reviewed on stream and for people who don't have the money to get their copy reviewed on stream, see the comments that other people get and the common mistakes and successes that other people make. Now, uh i think that was the full spiel if you would like your copy either whetstoned and or wednesdayed uh you can become a patreon supporter at patreon.com slash the copy that show um your donations ultimately do not go to my lamborghini fund they go to the uh make sillier and sillier videos that ultimately show me shirtless fund so if you want to support the channel consider becoming a patron we have a ton of stuff on there but uh really we you know we're not getting rich off of this we're trying to do this to build something that actually helps you and hopefully hopefully that's actually working now um i'm going to test and check and see and make sure that everything is live it seems i have four people as you can tell i'm not where i normally am i'm currently in florida i'm here because I had to do two business deals, I had a big meeting with owner investors for two, yeah, two of my businesses. Um, I'm also filming three videos and I'm hosting another business deal that people are coming in from Japan for, I'm going to launch a new division of a business there. And so I have been under just an unholy amount of stress for the past couple of weeks. That's why we have not uh, done one of these in a couple of weeks. Alex is moving. Lindsay is sick. Rod is three hours behind me. So it just makes it difficult for him to take time off to Whetstone a Wednesday. So um, before I get started, anybody have any questions, anything that they uh, want to ask before we get into it, into the thick of it? Let me know. Can anybody even hear me? That's one of the scary things about these streams. I, I never have any idea unless I see comments coming in. Anybody? Is there, is there anybody there? <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to put a note up on our Discord channel, which you can join using, I believe, some of the links below. Hey at everyone. Reviewing or copy today here. All right. Hey, people actually responded. Very good. Good to see you all. Um, because I don't have my normal like surfboard style monitor, um, I'm going to be jumping around a lot uh, between screens. It's going to be hard for me to actually see comments. And I'm actually going to start going out of order. I'm going to start with one that came in relatively recently, and I'm going to jump back to the beginning, and we're going to go through copy there. And I want to illustrate something for you because I think it's a valuable lesson for people that are like just starting to put together their sample portfolio. So. Really quick, let me present, share screen, Chrome tab. There we go. So this, if you can see it, is somebody's uh, landing page that they wanted to have reviewed. Now, uh, the person basically stated that 
Oh, lovely. Uh, thank you all. I'm, I'm seeing your comments come in. I appreciate you all. Uh, seriously, if anything goes wrong or if audio cuts out or you can't see anything, just spam chat. Uh, just call me a bald idiot. Uh, I mean, you can do that anyway if you want. I won't appreciate it, but you can. Um, and we will fix whatever problems are occurring. Obviously, I've never worked with this setup before. So this particular copywriter, he's a Patreon member. He posted that he is working on a landing page that he made for BlizzCon. I thought, oh, interesting. Most of what we're going to be talking about today are product pages. So it would be interesting to actually look and see somebody's copy for an actual landing page. Now, I got to this and I immediately went, wait a minute. And I looked up the actual landing page for BlizzCon. And this is it. What do you guys notice between the real page and the sample that this person is making? This is not this is not a trick. This is the real thing. Here you go. Here is the actual spec piece that was mocked up by a member of Copy That. Or not copy that, but uh, somebody who's a patron. Is this a Raid Shadow Legends ad? <laughs> Pretty similar. He's done a better mock-up. So you think this is better than the actual original thing? Interesting. So let's actually look at the copy. BlizzCon, November 3rd, 4th, uh, 2023, Anaheim, California. See you there. Purchase tickets. So obviously we know BlizzCon, they're being pretty direct. This is what the person said. Don't miss out. So same information, same logo, same imagery. The only thing that has changed is they've added urgency and scarcity. Now, that's fine. Wow, Blizzard hires freelancers. No, that is not the case. So what this person did was they said, well, I want to make a landing page for my spec portfolio. And so what they decided to do was take a landing page that's out there in the world for something that they probably are interested in. I'm presuming video games because most of the people into copywriting nowadays are young and into video games. Um, and they are they were looking at the original page and they were like, okay, well, how can I modify this to make it better? And I'm starting here because I think there's a valuable lesson in here. Now, the my immediate thought when I see this and I see this is if you try to approach a company with a slightly modified version of a page that they already have that exists that really only slightly alters some of the copy, some of the language, they're going to laugh you out of the room. Why is that? In marketing, there's a common phrase, and this is something that I want you all to internalize, which is test screams, not whispers. Now, a scream test is something where something is radically different, where the headline is completely different, where the approach, the imagery, everything is totally different. The hierarchy of messaging is totally different. You're testing an offer lead against a story lead, like radically different stuff. The reason why you do that is because that will actually give you good information about what performs better. If something is so similar, and the only difference in that headline is see you there versus don't miss out, you have no real idea what's causing the uplift or not. It could just be statistical noise. That is what we call a whisper. And even though the emotion is different, the page is not different enough to actually give you good information. So. Ultimately, what you want to do is test screams, not whispers. The other issue that I see immediately arising from this is if somebody looked at this person's portfolio and assessed it and then was like, this person worked for Blizzard and then went and pulled up the BlizzCon page, they might be a little skeptical. I'm not saying that a lot of companies actually do this, um, but some of them might. And so it's something to be conscientious of, that they might actually go to the original source material and be like, 
did this person just plagiarize this page? And for the most part, structurally, you can see the headline, it's in the same spot. The design is basically the same. The second spot, limited time loop, introducing BlizzCon collection. And then the second bit, we are pleased to introduce BlizzCon collection. Like, this is hardly different. It is, if I were teaching an English class, I'd be like, this is plagiarized. And the student would be like, no, it isn't. I changed some of the words. And I'd be like, kill me now and get me out of the teaching profession. Uh, maybe I'll try copywriting. And that's basically what happened. And so ultimately, this original page, they structured it in a particular way for a particular reason. That takes me to the third thing that's going wrong with this particular sample and why you might not want to put it in your spec piece. And the reason why you wouldn't want to put it into your spec portfolio, you wouldn't want to necessarily use it, is because I think it shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the marketing purpose of the original page to begin with. And that is because I think that every single copywriter, when they first start out, has a major case of main character syndrome, which is they think that they are the main character, not an NPC, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Um, and so ultimately, what they did was create and modify the language to appeal more to directly to consumers, to gamers, like, in all likelihood, the person who wrote this. Now, take a look at some of these appeals. Don't miss out. That implies urgency. Brace yourself, War Warcraft fans. Okay, we're going for gamer fans. Endless fun awaits. Join our community. Okay, interesting that they would choose that. This page, I can tell just from intuiting it, is designed to appeal to gamers. And you might look at this page and go, well, of course BlizzCon is supposed to appeal to gamers, to which I would say, no, no. Look at what BlizzCon was trying to do. BlizzCon first glimpse for press and content creators. BlizzCon doesn't exist for gamers. BlizzCon serves a marketing function for Blizzard and Activision. The purpose of this page is not to get more gamers to go. The purpose is to get press people, content creators, to make content and make stuff about what they show there that then appeals to gamers to buy the products. This is an extremely important distinction. And it, again, highlights a fundamental misunderstanding that this particular copywriter had when they sat down to actually make this page. They operated in the assumption, oh, Blizzard? convention, it must be for gamers. And that's a huge mistake because he was looking at it through the lens of a gamer. He wasn't looking at it through the lens of the company that is trying to do something like to scale in their marketing. And that is the three lessons that I want you to take away from the mishaps of this particular page so that you can avoid them. You really want to understand what the business is trying to do with this page. If we were trying to appeal to consumers, do you think that this BlizzCon, November 3rd through 4th, 2023, Anaheim, California, don't miss out, do you think that that would appeal to gamers? Probably not. And I can prove this, I can prove this by looking at the page for PAX. For somebody who doesn't really game anymore, I know far too much about gaming conventions and gaming culture. Welcome to PAX. PAX is a celebration of gaming and gaming culture that takes place annually in Boston, Seattle, Melbourne, and Philadelphia, featuring thought-provoking panels, a massive expo hall filled with the best publishers and studios, new game demos, musical performances, tournaments, and a community experience unlike any other. Guys, when you look at this, do you kind of know what PAX is? Do you know kind of know what PAX is for? Do you kind of know who PAX is for? I do. It's for gamers and people that are interested in the gaming industry, or at least getting involved in it. Also publishers, also content creators, stuff like that. When you look at the Blizzard page, who's this for? This page is automatically assuming that the people that are going to be most, like, brought in are probably going to be like professional streamers, content creators, media people, the people that can spread their message to followers better than Blizzard can. Is this an actual site? Yes, this is an actual site. 
This is a mock-up. As you can tell, not very different. So that is why um, I don't think this is working very, very well. And if I were to suggest making a spec piece, I would start more simply. Like I appreciate that this person tried to mock it up in Canva and design it. That's called wireframing for anybody making spec portfolios and pieces, stuff like that. Get the copyright first and not copyright first. I mean, get the copy correct first before you start mocking it up. Um, you know, that's messaging hierarchy. That's the angle of approach. That's the understanding of the demographic that you're trying to appeal to, yada, yada, yada. So that's all stuff that I want you guys to keep in mind. All right. No more talk about gaming. Gaming is stupid. <laughs> Just watching the viewers tick down. All right. Get the copy correct primarily. First and foremost. Yes, yes, yes. Now, this next bit, this next one that we are going to look at is going to be a product page for the Copy That Masterclass um, on storytelling, the one that I did. It's one of the three that I put the most effort into. Um, just so everybody knows, there is a current standing offer for anybody who has access to some of our product pages that they can actually create copy for Copy That, and we will pay you 150 bucks for it, and we'll give you critiques and other fun stuff like that. So just to explain very briefly, if you go to our webpage, you go to digital products, then actually look here, we have products for sale. These, all of these are in the Patreon, but not everybody wants to sign up for a subscription. So we give people the option. So if you want, go to make it rain. And as you can see, the guys and Lindsay and I have simply not had time to sit down and write out a whole lot of product description copy for these. So like any good business owner did, we decided to exploit the asymmetries uh, uh, in the market for us. No, I'm joking. I'm not really. That's how capitalism works. Uh, no, we're crowdsourcing stuff so that you guys get paid to create copy that can also be in your spec portfolio and also get feedback on your copy, which everybody wins in the end. So one of the things that we've been doing for the past couple of months is actually trying to solicit copy. Here's an example of a page where somebody wrote the copy. This person was a patron. And we actually accepted the copy and we paid this person. Look at this. We got bullets. We got a small lead. It's very beneficial. It's very direct and to the point. Yada, yada, yada. Very benefit driven. It's a standard product page. And in fact, we have a masterclass on product pages in patreon.com slash the copy that show. It's almost like all of this is serving a marketing function. Anyway. God, some people find my sense of humor detestable and other people find it very funny and endearing. Hopefully you were one of the latter. Anyway, so this is for our story masterclass, how to naturally build intrigue an advanced masterclass in using storytelling to sell. So the title that we currently have for this particular masterclass, advanced, the spark that sells. Now, is there a deadline for it, Sean? No. Uh, well, the deadline is when we have copy for all of our product pages. We do have a few new masterclasses that we just added to Patreon that we have not added to the web page. Uh, so there is going to be a constant influx of new things to write copy for, which you are welcome to do. So. <laughs> I already have all the, the things queued up. So you're going to ask me to go back to Discord and like bring up your page? Oh, terrible. Frankly, terrible. So is there a deadline? No, there is no deadline. Uh, we might close it temporarily at some point just so that we can review copy that is not product pages for a few months. <laughs> you know, just so that people who watch these are just not like, oh, God, another product page. Uh um, but I think for the meantime, we're going to keep it open and anybody who wants to submit can do it. Now, here's the other thing that you have to keep in mind. We're not going to accept your copy if it fucking sucks. Sorry. <laughs> like the whole point of this is so that we can be very harsh and like push you to be better. 
And so we're going to try to get your copy to at least a C minus to C level. And so once it hits that passing grade, then we will accept it and we will pay you. But we're not going to just pay you to like make you go away. And in fact, there are some people that have actually submitted and revised, I think three, four or five times. And you know, we just haven't accepted it yet because their copy just isn't there yet. And that's how this is going to go. Which is good for you, if you think about it that way, because it means that we're going to pressure you to actually try to get better and to think more. But for real, if your copy is good enough and it is what we're looking for, we'll pay you and we'll publish it. And you can use it as a sample. So this is the copy for this storytelling masterclass. Now, really quick for the chat, let me ask you guys this. How to naturally build intrigue versus the spark that sells. Which do you think is a better title for this particular masterclass? Also, unironically, yes, this is exactly what I want you to do. Also, I was talking to uh, Chris Haddad, Justin Goff, and Kyle Milligan about David Deutsch. And we were all sharing stories about how David had all, except for Kyle, made us cry at one point getting copy reviewed by David Deutsch. Uh, David Deutsch is a fantastic copy mentor. Um, if you listen, I'm I'm all about like spreading the love and platforming other people that I think are really good. If you can learn anything from David Deutsch, he's really good. How to is pretty powerful stuff. Definitely the first one, Spark that sells more intrigue in the original one. Spark that sells wins by a landslide. I agree. I think Spark that sells is much more interesting than this how to naturally build intrigue because you might think the spark that sells is vague but it's evocative and it's evocative of what is actually revealed in the actual master class one of the best templates for titles if you need a template for a title is have something metaphorical in the actual title. So for example, the four hour work week, colon, and then the subtitle describes what it actually is in a more specific way. Now that, look up any book that you like that's nonfiction, and you will find that that's basically the template for it. Metaphor, colon, subtitle that actually reveals what it is. That's what we're going for here. Now, how to naturally build intrigue. I would say that that's more vague than the spark that sells because ultimately this leaves off most of the things inside the thing. And it doesn't naturally evoke anything really. Like this would be good for like a blog post, maybe. That depends. So this, good copywriting doesn't explain but evoke. It really depends on the copy you're writing. Most of the time, you don't want to explain your copy ever. Sometimes you do, but it's very rare. It's very contextual. So would I say that the four-hour work week is a big idea? Um, I think that it is a very strong idea, and I think that most people would naturally use it as an example of a big idea. My video about big ideas uses this as well, but my thinking on big ideas has evolved in the last few years, and that's because of my conversations with the person who originally popularized the concept of the big idea, Mark Ford. And one of the things that he said to me, which I find very persuasive, is the fact that, like, what, what are we talking about? Well, what are the things that sell? Like, what, what are they? They're promises, gimmicks notions, ideas, and big ideas. Like those are the five things that you can use to sell something. That, that's it. There's nothing else. And so a promise, the four hour work week, well, that's an emotionally compelling promise. That is an implied promise of an outcome that somebody can get. And when we talk about notions, that's like, you know, showing a cowboy smoking a Marlboro cigarette and stuff like that. So you 
subconsciously associate, oh, what I want to be as a man with smoking cigarettes. And that's how those kinds of ads work. Rod is an expert at that stuff. Um, uh, the, the other one gimmicks is like, you know, Lamborghinis, buy one, get one free. Like the whole point is to just like get people to the door very quickly. And then uh, an idea is just a sales argument. Like, you know, if you want to get rid of your corns, this is the best way to do it. And, you know, standard problem solution kind of stuff. But a big idea is something much bigger than that. It's not only is it an argument, it's about something of like great social impact. Um, and so, and again, like, don't take what I'm saying right now about the big idea to be like gospel, because if you ask five copywriters what the big idea is, you will get eight answers. I'm, I'm being completely for real. I actually was just in a lock-in with uh, Todd Brown and 19 other of the best copywriters in the world. And I was giving this whole spiel and explaining it. Um, and Peter Kell, a VSL writer that I admire very, very much, kind of just ignored everything that I said and just was like, the big idea is the bridge between you and a per what a person wants. And I would say that that's probably just a promise or some sort of unique mechanism. You know, that's not really a big idea. Whereas a big idea is like the impact that monetary policy has on a nation's character or the cyclicality of history and the cycle that we are about to enter. These, these are actually ideas. You know, they're actually compelling, emotionally evocative, interesting. They're timely. You can't have a big idea if it's not timely. Four-hour work week isn't very timely. Yeah, Pekel is a really cool dude. Really, really smart. So, was I in the private mansion as well? Yes, yes, I was. Uh, I actually will be getting an affiliate link for this, but you, you guys don't need to make sure I get money. Uh, Todd Brown has a whole sales page that's going up. Um, there's going to be seven installments. I think the second one just went up. They're pretty good. It's a, it's good copy uh, and it's a good thing. Listen, if you are intermediate to advanced as a copywriter, you're already making money and you just want to like get more insights from people that are, have been doing this for Christ combined 200 years, more than that. Yeah. If you want to benefit from 300 years of experience, get that but you don't need to anywho what historical cycle are we about to enter i don't know the fourth turning who knows <laughs> where can i buy one and get one free lamborghini anyway this whole spiel was about how i don't really like this as a title because it's not naturally evocative and i think that titles and again lots of people have different opinions about this so this is just mine you want naturally evocative, metaphorical, something that like prompts a person to think, then a specific description of what it is. All right, and then this is the top copy. So if you go to any like Amazon page, this is going to be like the, the bullets like at the very top right there. Storytelling is a simple but powerful technique for any copywriter's toolbox. Missing a apostrophe there. Once you understand this technique, your sales copy will become 100% more effective. That's a big promise. Why is storytelling the perfect technique to persuade and influence in sales copy? Has a clearly defined structure. Has Stories have been used to... This doesn't make any sense. This feels like it's just talking at me. Yeah. You know, these are not good bullets. Um, this doesn't really have anything that feels beneficial except for this big promise that is not something I would feel comfortable making at all. So the headline, Master Storytelling Today! Exclamation point, exclamation point. Master Storytelling to become a persuasive copywriting expert sentence fragment by employing the techniques demonstrated in the video. Oh, not a sentence fragment. Sorry. Your stories will transform into a clear and concise narrative that captivates your readers. You will be amazed at the power of stories in grabbing your audience's attention because stories inherently possess a familiar structure that resonates naturally. 
with your readers. <clears throat> so I just read, <laughs> it feels like a brain dump today. Master storytelling today, right now. Those three sentences. By the way, can you guys, you guys can see this, right? I want to be conscientious, but I also am completely out of my normal comfort zone. All right. <sighs> Too many angles. Yeah. It's, it feels very dumpy. It feels very unfocused, very unfiltered, very unrefined. Um, like this person hasn't really thought about like what the true benefit of storytelling is. And I actually explain it in the masterclass. In the masterclass that this person is trying to sell, one of the things that I talk about with story is the fact that story is a natural bypass for the human filter against things that they're skeptical about. Story is a way to reach people emotionally and intuitively in such a way that normally facts and promises cannot. So stories ultimately are really ideal for people that are very skeptical, for people that are on the more unaware side of these stages of awareness. Uh, Lindsay has a horrible eye infection right now and she couldn't make it today. I went trick-or-treating with her last night and she was getting like gradually worse and worse. We had to cut trick-or-treating short and today she had to go to the doctor. So, oh well. So going with a shotgun instead of a sniper. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Too many angels is my metal core. <laughs> okay, thanks, Warren. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, can argue with facts. You can't argue with a story. I absolutely agree. And, <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. Alex said the best way to write copy for this masterclass would be to start the description with a story. There's a reason I'm in business with that dude because he's right he's absolutely right like if you learned from the master class tell a story actually use a story lead and it doesn't have to be a long story you can imply a story with a single sentence but this also is missing the bullets for the master class so we're going to hit abort on this we are not going to accept this all right we're moving on so this is another product page for my email sequences masterclass. I mentioned that there were three that I put a lot of effort into. This is this, the second one. Sorry, I'm drinking a Monster Energy drink, so apologies if I burp into the microphone. I'll make sure to do it really close so that there's like an ASMR kind of thing. Again, like I said, some people find my humor detestable. Hopefully you guys don't. I've had an eye infection for five years, still not getting used to it. Dude, it takes antibiotic drops, man. <laughs> oh, uh, I just watched the five hour copy that course. Excellent. I know you said that copy that guys are working on an even better course for beginners coming out soon. And to be honest, I'm super excited for it. Yeah, um, you know, Alex and I are scripting it. Um, just to give you guys a, tease of what we're working on. We want to do a masterclass where we go over all the basics, like everything you need to know to just understand what copywriting even is and why people pay for it and why it's such a good job. And then we're breaking up the other aspects of copywriting into three other pillars, which is writing, research, and outreach. Alex is working on the outreach one. Lindsay and Rod are working on writing and research. I'm probably going to hop in and we're all going to collaborate on this uh, as well. But basically, the way things are shaping up, it's looking like this is going to be about 10 to 12 hours of content that we're just going to release for free. We'll pepper it with some, you know, a few plugs here and there. But yeah, we're going to try to do, uh, yeah, just release those four uh, pillars of copywriting. And ultimately, the goal with those is to replace some of the stuff that we have in our 21-day course, because it's going to take you 21 days to do everything that we suggest and that particular 10 hour course. So uh, would that be available? Yeah, it's gonna be for free. It's, we're, we're gonna give it all for free. The goal with this is to literally give in one spot, like one four video playlist, 
absolutely everything a person needs to know to get a copywriting client to go from like what even is copies to okay i can i can do this client getting thing so <laughs> copywriting is 90 days to 10k a month yeah yeah uh, we just made a video making fun of that kind of stuff so <laughs> spent an hour hand copying gary bensevig this morning why am i not a billionaire yet uh i can't tell you gary's good though i i really enjoy gary bensevig's copy him gary halbert i also like dan kennedy too so i didn't think it could be better than the five-hour course so here's the thing the five-hour course it was made like in some of the earlier videos that i made for copy that um we made them not thinking that copy that would be a business so if you go through the five hour course, you'll notice that there's no mention of like the channel existing and it just kind of ends. There's no call to action. There's nothing. And we're going to try to keep in our free course those to a minimum. Like, again, we only want to take money from people who, one, can benefit from what we have to say on the back end Two, people that want to give us money and three people that like want to go beyond like, OK, that basic competence. So. Yeah. But basically, yeah, the, the whole point is to just give people a solid baseline. And so that's what we're working on. And in fact, you're going to notice that we're not going to be releasing as many new videos for probably a few months just because we're working on all that stuff. So I'm also in Florida and it, yeah, everything's topsy turvy. OK, let's actually look at some copy. Cash conveyor belt. So this is a master class that I did. It's an advanced master class about email sequences. What is an email sequence? An email sequence is where you plug into a platform or program, uh, active campaign, keep, uh, sorry, yeah, keep, um, uh, which used to be Infusionsoft, other things like that. And you can basically program it so that uh, an email goes out. And then after a certain amount of time, another email goes out. A uh, famous example of this would be Daniel Throssell's persuasive page, uh, his uh, parallel welcome sequence. I think Rod is going to join me. So yeah, anywho, um, business owners will pay dollar signs for anyone who can automate their sales process. True. And if you are an advanced copywriter who can engineer profitable email sequences, you're in the mad money zone. Oh, uh, this masterclass will teach you how to produce profitable email sequences that you can charge your clients hundreds, if not thousands, including. Hmm. The million dollar webinar email sequence of victory. Learn the process behind Sean's unique sequence that earned over a million dollars for his client. Swipe everything he's learned about webinars, funnels and sequences from one image. OK. Master the most terrifying and profitable email sequences. It's less common, more complicated, and way harder to understand conceptually than these standard sequences. But when you understand this two-word logic, you can start charging mad dollar signs. The number one way to charge your clients more for your sequences. Offer to write these three commonly forgotten email sequences for more money. Yeah. I don't know. What do you guys think of these bullets? I'm going to show this comment, and then I'm going to show this comment. I'm not going to comment on these comments at all. So I actually vaguely remember seeing this copy. I don't think it's been edited very much from what the original draft was. I'd close the web page at this point. Yeah, same. It's not helping the product. Yeah, just so you guys understand like what the purpose of this kind of copy is, if you go to digital products and then go down to, um, you know, let's do grab them by the eyeballs. So look at this. This one doesn't have any bullets, but you can see whether it's a blog, a sales letter, or a website homepage, you need to have rock and headlines and an opening paragraph, aka the lead or lead if you're a pedant. 80 cents of every dollar you spend on ads, you're spending on your headline and lead. In this 70 minute private masterclass that Sean ran, he goes over everything you need to know to write headlines that capture attention and leads that get people to keep reading your copy. 
tells you exactly what it is, tells you exactly what you're going to get, tells you exactly what it's focusing on, it tells you exactly what the benefits are right there. Here's another example. Uh, we'll just go over this. Actually, no, let's do a different one that uh, this one. No, not that one. I even forget. I uh, got the yes, this one. Uh, this is a good one. Product pages are an overlooked way for newbie copywriters to build their portfolio and get paid well for doing it. Demand is high. Product pages have a direct effect on your client's sales. You don't need to be a master of persuasion. Look at that. Within, what is this? Less than 100, 150 words, you immediately know what this is, what's in it for you, like an argument for why this type of copy is fairly important. Like, it shows you the benefits. It's very compressed. It's very concise. And it also, you know, like people are pointing out, it's not using terrifying to try to hook people. So, you know, I think that this is just, it's going at it the wrong way. It's thinking about things the wrong way. One of the ways that I see it thinking about it the wrong way is ultimately the focus is on, this is like what I was saying at the beginning of this particular stream, which is that the person is looking at it through the lens of what they want and not necessarily what people who need a, a masterclass on email sequences wants. Um, and the way that I am trying to say that and articulate this is they are thinking of it as, oh, if you know email sequences, you'll be able to get more clients. And I don't know if I would ever say that or intend that as a promise. I don't know if I want to make that promise to begin with. Um, it can be useful, but really, what is the thing that this maximizes? It maximizes or at least optimizes revenue from an email list. So ultimately, when you go through this, it kind of feels diffuse. It kind of feels like that, oh my God, a rod is here. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm well, man, stress as hell, how are you? I am great. I just walked and turned through a college essay. So, you know, doing that high level marketing today. <laughs> Getting paid the big bucks, big I love bucks. it. Yeah, I was just kind of talking about how this is a sort of slight revision of something that we looked at before and really mm -hmm. i think that rather than like a line edit or a function edit this person needs to go to a blank page and rethink like what angle they even want to use for this uh -huh. and i use this as an example because it clearly explains what things are in a single sentence you know yeah. it's not it's not dragging on for one Two, the three bullets really spell out succinctly an argument for like why this is worth learning, what the benefit to you is, and also like what makes it a little bit easier than one would normally expect. Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't think that this is doing that at all. <laughs> Look at this comment. <laughs> I'm glad they respect my time though. Sorry. I, we we should probably just hit the abort button on this then. So we haven't country. even gotten to the headline. Oh, well, you're in Oregon, so Oregon's you're great. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're we're good here. Yeah, I'm in Florida, which you know, it is what it is. So, master the strategies behind creating profitable email sequences that consistently land you high-paying gigs. Again, that's not the promise here. You know, yeah. that's not for me when I think of email sequences and the promise that they have, you're coming at it from the wrong perspective. And that's one of the reasons why we sort of separated out beginner masterclasses and advanced masterclasses, mm -hmm. which is beginner masterclasses, yes, you can learn stuff that will help you actually get clients. But once you get into a more advanced, you know, late beginner, early intermediate stage of your career, you're not thinking about that kind of stuff you're yeah. going to be more inclined to be thinking about like, well, how can I help this business make more money? Mm -hmm. And that is the promise 
of an email sequence. Yeah, I, I think a good way of thinking about this too is like where like like where where is your focus actually going to be once you're in the situation? So to use a sports example, like let's say you've never played soccer before and you join a soccer team. Of course, you know, the first couple of weeks of that is gonna be how do I get to be on the playing field? But once you are used to being on the field, once you're getting those reps consistently, it stops being how can I get more play time? And it should become more how do I become more applicable when I'm on the field? How do I do the things that I actually want to do that contribute, of course, to being on the field more, but also there are some higher level things here that we're trying to do that are it's not just, you know, get pay, or get more gigs. It's how do I get paid more for the work I'm already doing? How do I make the work I'm doing actually better for my clients? Because you're starting to understand the relationship between the work you're doing and getting paid more. And it's less just like, oh, getting paid. Yeah. I think... I'm going to nerd out for a second here, and it's only yeah. because he used the word efficable. And now I'm just going to... Please. On that... that <laughs> on my nerd game. Um, yeah, I, I think about things from like a phenomenological perspective. Like, what do yes. people know relative to what they have actually experienced? And one of the things that is going to make writing a page like this hard for a newbie is that they likely have never actually seen the results, the tangible results yeah. that an email sequence can do for a business. And when you talk to a business owner, they do not automatically have in their head the assumption that an email sequence will benefit them at all. It's actually mm -hmm. something you have to sell them on because yeah. they can be tedious and hard to make, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, what is the promise there? Ultimately, it's another tool in your toolbox to maximize revenue for a business. It's something that you can, you know, a service that you can add to make more money, but it's not something that would, like you said, get you onto the field. Mm -hmm. In my opinion. You know, I completely agree. It's, it's funny too, because there, that's also why I think to me, a lot of those like scammy copywriting tactics, people like feel weird to me or like listening to their students talk feels focused on like the doing 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 when it's not clear that they actually have an understanding of like what that doing is producing out in the real, real world like yeah yeah it's um i was talking to mark ford and he talks about um the difference between outside knowledge and inside knowledge mm -hmm. and there are just certain things mm -hmm. that you only know if you know and you can only know it if you're actually in the world doing stuff in the world mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's going to prevent you from writing a good landing page for this, you know, stupid product description. I'm saying that, like, at a certain point in your career, you start to learn stuff that, like, you just did not even know that you didn't know yeah. before you got it. You could understand all the theory. You could have read thousands of sales letters. But then all of a sudden you're thrust into a position where you have to, like, soften language in a compelling way because legal and compliance came back and said, this is not going to fly. There's no course out there for that. There's nobody that can teach you that. You, It's just something you have to learn. Yeah. 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 Hold on. We have this. Would you say that the master class is beginner or more? So it's, this is an advanced master class. We have a few that we posted to Patreon. It's 20 bucks a month, not 30 bucks a month. And uh, we are not going to put more advanced master classes in there. We're going to stick with just putting beginner master classes into the Patreon and then find better homes for our more advanced stuff. Um, the whole point of that is because uh, I actually do think it is our duty to prevent newbies from getting distracted with like shiny, flashy objects. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, the last thing that you want is for a beginner to be worrying about, I don't know, uh, let's say they become an expert in like long form direct response copywriting. They go to like, you know, like a mom and pop, like crystal seller. And really what they need is just like good descriptions for their Etsy page. Yeah. And you're going to try to sell them on like what you need is a sales letter sent via direct mail. That's like, no, 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 no. Uh, we don't want to do that. I've seen it happen before, too. It's unfortunately common. So I'm going to say we have to say no to this particular page. Really think you need to rework and rethink 
the idea here and the approach that you're making. Here we have a copywriting portfolio. Ooh. Interesting. Very interesting. By the way, Rod, how are you doing overall? How am I doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm doing great, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, how much longer are you in Florida for? I'm here until the 15th. Okay. So I'm here for one full month, and then we are driving back. Oh. For us who are not subscribed to the Patreon, uh, but want to write the ad, no, sorry, you have to pay. Like we've given multiple ways to pay to get these. If you want to write copy for them, you got to know what's in them, and the only way to know what's in them is to watch them. To be fair, they could get incredibly lucky and just guess what's in them, and write perfect copy based off of that. And if True. you and if you manage to write great copy for it without having watched it. Kudos to you. That is also very, very true. Hmm. Yeah. I didn't think about that. So, Black Hoodie Guy, yes. You can get absolutely astoundingly lucky. So, let's see. This is Copywriting Portfolio. Um, I believe that this person gave some context in the Discord. Let me pull it up and actually read it. Okay. Um... First go at a portfolio, any feedback is welcome. Also, how would I incorporate this into a website? Is there any point in making a website with portfolio without social proof? Okay. Ooh. So scrolling through, we're gonna get through a fraction of this, maybe the first email. Mm -hmm. Really what I want to see you do, person who made all of this, is I want you to stop watching this and I want you to go watch our portfolio building masterclass, where we had a person with a really good portfolio and a lot of really good insights on building a portfolio, who's had a lot of success over the years, laugh a lot like that, and actually share what he did in terms of his portfolio. The way that he broke it up, even like you don't even need testimonials, that's something you can add later. But he took projects broke them into folders, put them into the actual folders, and then recorded videos where he explained like what this is, what he did, why he did what he did. And the reason for that is because one, it shows that you know what you're doing. Two, it shows that you can be an asset. Three, it shows that you can articulate and talk to the business owner in a way that actually would benefit them. Like just watch this portfolio masterclass. And if you do it this way, you are going to do a lot better than most of the other people out there that are just slamming stuff either onto a website or just throwing stuff into Google Docs. And the reason why is because that extra effort, well, that's a credibility booster. And you yeah. want more credibility when you get out there into the market. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, is that you will likely end up applying for jobs that are across a huge wide range of fields. And so you're not going to be able to have spec pieces for all that or like actual real work that demonstrates your competence in all of those fields. And so if I were hiring a copywriter, what I would look for way more than area knowledge is an understanding of where all these different pieces of content actually fit into the marketing life cycle. And so if you can articulate or at least demonstrate at a portfolio level that you understand how all the stuff fits together and when you would use X versus when you would use Y, that is going to do you way more favors than, um, you know, having a random testimonial from Upwork. Yeah, I, I would agree with that 100%. It, listen, it's, I don't want to be Kyle Milligan for a moment, but it is a lot like dating. It you is know, dating. It is dating. You know, you're meeting somebody for the first time and if you show up and you, you're just in schlubby clothes and you immediately ask for like a ride home after the date and you're at like you basically say like oh you know i you know i'm kind of short on money for a moment you know at the moment can you can you pay and like but then when you the person finally like consents and says yes you just immediately start ordering the most expensive stuff on the restaurant you know and then you start telling like stories about all your exes and like what they like to do in bed like if you come off like that they're not going to like you. That is not going to be a successful date. So, no. 
True. Really quick, we have a question. So the answer to this, do you have to be subscribed to the Patreon in order to submit the product pages? No, you do not. So for example, some people can't subscribe to Patreon because they live in a country that Patreon doesn't do business with. We have no control over that. But we do offer people a chance to buy individual masterclasses by themselves. And we'll take anybody's money. Um, we, we greedy like that, I guess. Um, but in that case, email it to us. I will admit, though, we are way worse at keeping track of who submits via email versus who submits via Discord. So. It's, this is true. Yeah. I will say, and this person, pay for one month, watch all the masterclasses becoming expert, write the most amazing copy for masterclasses, get paid for the copy. So you paid zero for the sub and made some profit. Yes, this is a good strategy. The only problem with this strategy is, one, if you don't become an expert and don't get paid the money, and you end up having to revise a bunch of times. And two, I think at this point we have more content on there than can be reasonably watched in a single month. We definitely have hundreds of hours of content. So at this point, we have hundreds of hours in there. So let's say it's 200, that's 50 hours a week of you doing this. I mean, that's more than a full time job, which, you know, props to you if you can pull that off. But also, I would want to do that. Yeah. Uh, honest to God, if you just want to snort meth and consume our content, um, I'm going to have to say, please don't do that. Seek help. <laughs> All right. Let's actually look at this. So ALR, Haas IPO in history example. Okay, okay. so uh, we are friends. Well, you're acquainted. I'm actually friends with the person who wrote this promo. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming this is a lift. Okay. New opportunity on the stock market being promoted by American hedge fund manager, James Altucher, former hedge fund manager, a sales email based upon a sales letter. He did promoting a new stock market opportunity. Rod, do you know immediately the comment that I'm going to have for this person without um, even that, reading it? That it's, this is not a sales email. It should not be a sales email. You nailed it. So, Really quick, a lot of people ask, what is a lift? What is a sales email? Mm -hmm. A lift is, it exists, it's an email. And the whole point of the lift is to build enough intrigue that people click to the sales message. The reason why you want to do that is because the sales message, the actual sales letter, is making an argument, presenting proof, building intrigue, stuff like that. If you start actually making the same argument in your email, well, you've just stolen a lot of the rhetorical power, the intrigue building that's on the sales page. Mm -hmm. So you've effectively just robbed the sales letter of its power by making the argument or starting the argument in the email. So a lift exists to literally disrupt and get attention, build enough intrigue to get the click, and then start persuading a person to actually want to buy or get interested in the product. Mm -hmm. A sales email you would want to do that if the product page itself doesn't have a whole lot of copy on it. If it's not making a sales argument, if it's just, you know, features and benefits, a few little pockets of social proof here and there, yada, yada, no argument really. So ultimately a sales email exists to do what the sales page is not. A lift exists to get people to the sales page. So, <clears throat> yeah. Do you want to read this one or shall I read this one? I will read this one. Okay. And then at any point you can hit the abort button. <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't know. It makes me laugh unreasonably. I, I also, it should be like the abort coat hanger, not button. Um, anyway, don't miss out on the opportunity of a lifetime. I'm sorry. I mean, I'll keep it. Um, how much does being <laughs> rich matter to you? Were you about to hit the abort button after the headline? <laughs> No, just I have questions already, but we'll let's get in a little bit and then we can dig into it. Um, yeah. How much does being rich matter to you? Do you have a plan? You, reading this now, are ahead of the crowd and could change your life with what I'm about to tell you. My name is James Altucher, and using my contacts as a former Wall Street hedge fund manager, I've known how this game is played for decades. Here's a sneak peek of what's inside the dossier. Exclusive market trends and analysis that show that blah blah blah. Okay, we're, okay, let's let's pause. Yeah, that's already a, a problem. Um, okay. So really, really quick, 
a sneak peek of what's inside the dossier. What, what dossier? Freaking dossier. What? Where did that come from? That came out of left field. Mm -hmm. Um. So this is already automatically assuming that people are aware of what the product is. Yeah. The whole point of a sales letter is to entice and intrigue people who are not product aware. You wouldn't need a sales letter to do a whole lot of convincing if a person is already like sort of on the fence about buying already really quick. Could you use a lift for a low and mid ticket product? Yes, of course you can. It just depends on what the lift is lifting to what is on the other side of the click. If the thing on the other side of the click is, I don't know, just a single squeeze page that says, you know, spend $50,000 and you'll get the club of a lifetime. Um, obviously, the you don't want to lift there. You probably want a sales email. How are their ads on a live stream? Uh, that That is a YouTube thing. If, if a channel is monetized, they will include midstream and midroll ads. Sorry. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could theoretically turn ads off for these, but then we would make no money. Oh, that would be a problem. Like we need that seventy cents of ad revenue that we're going to get from this. <laughs> I, I've heard that the going price for one fentanyl pill on the street right now is eighty cents, so that's almost enough for one good time. That's fine. So really quick, we got to hear, where is this going wrong? Rod, for you, where did this go wrong? Um, Aside from the first line. Well, the second line. Okay. And, and that, that's not me being sorry, but, but actually. Um, yeah. I, so I assume, actually, I don't know. I kind of just assume that don't miss out on the opportunity of a life that was a subject line or something, but that's probably not the case. So it probably is the first line of the email. But the second line, uh, how much does being rich matter to you? feels like it's 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 such an odd thing to ask to me because there's no contextualization there's no sort of like preloading of what the notion of being rich means in this context there's no are we talking about it from like a an abundance standpoint like oh provide from your family or um like a bugatti standpoint where we're talking about oh have all these it's like luxury and impress all the ladies whatever um, because they have not come into this email giving us any sort of idea of what the word rich means in this context, I, as a reader, read that and it feels incredibly flat. There's no sort of like imagery of like lush beaches in Panama that come to mind. And so it's just like, how much does it matter? Eh, not really. I mean, it'd be nice, but, and so it just immediately falls flat. And then the entire beginning of this is sort of based on the idea that this writer has that someone's going to care about that and that, that that's going to carry them through and make them intrigued in this dossier that they have no idea about. Um, and so that's a, that's a huge issue for me. Yeah. Uh, while you were saying Kyle in the chat wrote, but not Kyle, the other Milligan, Kyle. but the other Kyle who is a fan of us, mm -hmm. um, he says it's a shallow angle. Yeah. And that's you know essentially what you were just trying to say, which I completely agree. Much more succinctly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it, we need a copywriter to come in and like, you know, truncate everything that we're saying. Mm. Um, we got another question really quick, which is, are we going to go through everything today? And as much as I would love to, I can guarantee with 100% certainty that we will not get through everything today. The reason why is because I uh, need to be on child duty at 5 p.m. Eastern time and will not be streaming. Mm -hmm. So... Hard stop at five. Do you have Do you have more meetings today? Uh, yeah, I have a, I, I, my meeting is at five, so I have to hop off a couple minutes before. Uh, really quick, could you explain for everybody who doesn't know what agency ad agency life is like? How basically eighty percent of your days are just meetings? Yes, or waiting for meetings, or having meetings on your schedule and then rescheduled for other days. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. So you like go to work and you have work you're supposed to do and you kind of set yourself up to do that work around a schedule of meetings that you think you have. And then those meetings will often just jump 30 minutes forward or backwards or collide with other meetings. Then you have to reschedule other meetings because someone wants a new meeting or, oh, shit, the client just killed something. And now we need to have like an emergency meeting because 
we can't do anything without having a meeting because if you change something on your end, then 15,000 people are going to freak out and that's a bad time. So meetings, it's what's for dinner. Yeah, it's Rod is, uh, let me put it this way. Direct response is fun because you can one man army a direct response business, mm -hmm. but in an ad agency, uh, what you do is connected to the work that is being done by literally thousands of other people. And so yeah. it requires way more bureaucracy, way more connections, way more working with other people and across yeah. departments. So, yeah, I, I can give a great example of this too. It's like, so we had a creative idea for something um, that I can not say this week, but I can say next week. Um, that would be that we thought would be really, really cool. Um, and so in order to get permission to do that, we had to go through our client Nike so that they could go ask somebody else for permission to do a thing that then gets routed back to us to actually figure out the logistics of doing said thing. And so we had an idea and it took like two or three weeks to even figure out if it'd be worth our time to figure out how we could do the idea if we could get permission. Um, it's, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. <sighs> Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to answer some questions really quick. Uh, I I love looking at agency life from the outside mm -hmm. because I kind of like know, like have a sense because I've worked in bureaucracies before of like mm -hmm. what it's kind of like. Um, and as much as I love like what you're able to accomplish, like Rod's able to do some really cool stuff for the clients that his agency has mm -hmm. like the the brands that you know um but at the same time like within a bureaucracy there's only so much that any individual person can move the needle yeah i i think the higher up you go the more room you have the more sort of like institutional knowledge you acquire and so you can be a little bit more savvy and do some big things but particularly when you're like junior or mid-level you are just kind of subject to the whims of clients and everybody above you um, which is it's, it's fine but also can be very frustrating mm -hmm. all right really quick some questions beg your pardon please don't call me lord sean i'm not that lord cool. sean. what the fuck is that <laughs> is the copywriting market <laughs> saturated are, are there always new businesses yes there are always new businesses not only are there new businesses every day there are, mm -hmm. what is it, 30 million businesses in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Most of their copy sucks. Most of it sucks. Mm -hmm. And copywriting and marketing is only saturated at the very low end. So you got to think of it not as like a bell curve of skill, but rather as like an inverse exponential curve, yeah. which is at the very low level of skill. Anybody with delusions of grandeur and a laptop can, or even a cell phone can say, I'm a copywriter. But to actually get clients and to create work that benefits those clients, that's a whole other set of skills altogether. And that not very many people can do that. In fact, a lot of people who call themselves copywriters and are able to get clients, they still are not able to actually produce work that benefits clients. That's why there's so much bad copy out there in the world. So yeah, that's something to keep in mind. So really, I hate to use the term, but it really is a skill issue. One of the things that we try to do <laughs> a copy that is improve give you the stuff issue. to help yeah. you. Yeah. Improve your skills. You know, that's why we give away so much of our stuff for free. It's because like, you know, really like you're not going to make money knowing like how to reach out to clients or like how to cold email people you're going to make money from doing that a bunch and then hitting a ceiling and being like well how do i make more money how do i like actually increase my skills how do i benefit my clients more that's what we want to actually charge people for yeah so that's that's why i don't think it's saturated do i still work for agora yes i do do i still freelance i don't freelance anymore i was for a while taking freelance clients uh, because I wanted to stay fresh and in the game, but now I'm writing copy for my own businesses, one of which is half owned by Agora. So there you go. Uh, 
why do I feel my copy is good when I write, but when it is time to review, it's a complete <laughs> mess. Uh, this is called Dunning-Kruger syndrome. Uh, Rod, I'll let you take the Dunning-Kruger conversation. Man, okay. Well, so the, the, the Dunning-Kruger part of this is like your assessment of your skill feels very... Okay, so kindly, generously, softly, gently. We're gentle here when we want to be. You've probably spent a lot of time studying copy, um, a lot of time watching our videos, hopefully. If not, spend more time doing that. Very important. Um, and so you are able to recognize how much knowledge you have acquired, and that feels like a lot. And so when you sit down to write, when you are doing all the things that you've learned, you've practiced, you've studied, um, you are very aware of how much skill it takes to do the things that you're doing. Um, and that's very good. However, um, at the end of the day, copy or writing good copy is not just about how much you know. It's about your ability to sort of pick apart situationally when you should be using what or what situation um, maybe calls for like a dialing back. Um, and so you can know a lot about copy and also not be writing the kind of copy that your reviewer wants in that particular day. Um, there's also a piece of this where when you know a lot of things, you might end up throwing everything you know at every piece of copy, right? When most of the time you don't need to use every single skill. Um, and so you could just be overwriting as well. Um, and so depending on what kind of feedback you're getting, it might not be that your copy is, that your copywriting skills are bad, but rather that like there is, now that you've learned a lot, maybe it's time to start dialing it back and take a more focused look at um, how am I making decisions about what to write and when? Yeah. I, in my interview with Stephen Young and Daniel Throssell and Tanya Yo, it's available on the channel at youtube.com slash copy that. Um, Stephen chimed in with like one of the big problems with selling copywriting courses to newbies. Mm -hmm. And that is that the only way to sell copywriting to newbies is to make it feel like a knowledge issue. That is that if once you have the knowledge, you will be good. That's not true at all. That's why people sell things like the hacks that get you good at copy, the secrets to getting good at copy, the secrets to landing clients, yada, yada. Once you learn the secrets, you get the money. Once you get the money, you get the respect that your parents don't give you. That's how this works. That's that's how copywriting gurus are able to appeal to so many kids right now. And so that's the thing, though. Copywriting isn't about a knowledge gap. There is a knowledge gap, but it's narrower than you think. Copywriting is more about a practice gap, yeah. which is to say that even if you were born with talent, and even if you know a lot of musical theory, if you've never practiced violin, you're going to suck at the fucking violin. Yeah. So really the only way to get good at copy is to practice copy. And guess what? That doesn't sell very well. We will tell you that because copy that is not our primary source of income. If you don't pay us money, oh, well, we'll keep doing this. If a copy guru started actually telling you that truth, guess what? Their business disappears. <laughs> I, I think that point is so good. Um, I, I wish Stephen had talked more during that because everything he said would have felt so insightful to me. Um, yeah. But Oh, he's so cool, dude. Yeah. I would love to meet him. Um, but I, I think anyone who has tried to learn any other skill in their life would accept this. It just feels really different with copywriting because we think of it as a career. Um, and so a great example of this is like anyone who's ever tried to throw a football or who's tried to kick a soccer ball. Um, if you have watched a video, if you've seen professionals doing this, you can kind of figure out, oh, they're kicking the ball with this part of their foot or they're throwing it with this kind of flick of the wrist. It's pretty easy to intuit. But if you've tried to recreate that, you know that it's not just about knowing it. It's about doing it over and over to learn your body, to learn how your brain works, that connection or whatever, until you get to the point where you can do it reasonably well. And you're still not even close to like the level of like how the best athletes are doing it. It's just with copywriting, it's like, oh, it's about writing, it's about words, so therefore it must be a knowledge thing. When the reality is, no, it's the exact same thing. There's a connection between your brain and knowing all these things and like you being able to make decisions about when to do the right thing in which situation. And I think people would be much better served if they could come to understand that. Yeah. 
it's we often joke on the channel like you know we're the only ones who will tell you this because we're the only ones who love you i i, I actually <clears> want to <throat> stop making that joke because i don't want people to assume that we're love bombing them. <laughs> <laughs> like this is some pickup artistry shit. It's a cult. It's a it's a cult. It's a cult. We're cult. running a cult. Yeah, <laughs> the copy cult. Ignore everybody. Only we love you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, so I I need to stop making that joke because I, love I don't want joke. people to miss. It. I love that joke too, but you know, part of growing and learning is like reflecting on the things that you've done and being like, is that the best way to do this? It's not. Okay, this question: <laughs> Is it effective to spam emails with good copy to get clients? Like sending fifty thousand emails per day to huge companies' email lists. I'm going to go ahead and say no. The no. answer is no. Somebody no. else might give a more nuanced answer to this, but I'm just going to go ahead and say, fuck no. <laughs> Don't do this. Um, listen, there are two ways to make cold email work for you. One of them is with quantity. Send out a lot of buckshot into the sky, and you will be likely, or at least more likely, to hit a duck. That's quantity. Then there's quality, and that's what we recommend. And in fact, you should go watch our video where we spent 20 minutes telling you all the things that make cold emails bad and the things that you can do to make cold emails good that's for free it's on the youtube channel please watch it and one of the things that we stress is don't just spam out messages actually think about whom you're sending it to and how you're going to craft that message so that's our advice yeah have you ever done cold email no no, actually. I, I've i only sent a cold mail to three people, and I have a 100% response rate. And the reason for that is because I knew somebody that they knew, or I've done work in a similar business that they worked at, or like it, it was just a cinch. It was just a slam dunk. And so I already knew their business or people that they knew, mm-hmm. and it all led to work. So, yeah. Yeah, I feel like if you, ideally, you should never cold email. You should have some sort of connection to the person, even if it's like a third degree connection. So you can be like, oh, here's this relationship we share, this common interest or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. But that's not in vogue. And if we tell people that, they'll be like, but I heard that somebody could actually make a lot of money and get a lot of clients by like personal messaging people on Instagram. And it's like, yeah, if you're great at slipping into DMs and stuff like that and like not coming off like a creep you can make this work for you. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> okay. We got actually paid to answer a question. Oh, wow. Wow, Lucas, thank you very much. We appreciate you. Wow. So uh, Lucas just paid us to answer this question, so we'll actually have to pay attention to it. <laughs> Hello, guys. How would you advertise and publish an autobiography about a retired businessman who lost everything and is nobody now? He used to date Hollywood actresses in the 80s and was successful. Hmm. That's a tough one. And here's the reason why this is tough. Because if it's an autobiography, it's going to be lumped in with other autobiographies. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to make a sales page of that or for that that really highlights the benefits that somebody gets from that. Yeah, and if it were like, it, it really depends too on the way in which it's structured. If he's talking about it like a cautionary tale, then maybe you could come at it from a sort of like the rise and fall of this guy and like what really happened to tell all so you don't kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but if it's just like, oh, here's my life. Then... One thing that you can do, and I've seen a, a number of good marketers do this. In fact, Charles Duhigg did this before um, his book, The Power of Habit, came out, is either his publicist or he himself got in touch with the New York Times or Slate or Atlantic or something. Mm-hmm. And he basically pitched them on an article about like what he was doing. And like yeah. the, the way that that worked was he pitched the magazine or the blog on the article that he wanted to write and give them a sample of his credentials and stuff like that. And they were like, okay, yeah, write the article. So he got paid to write the article. And the advantage of that is twofold. One, it proved, because it was so popular, that there was a market for the book. The second thing is that happened there is that it drove traffic to the book. 
So it served a dual marketing function. And so you can certainly do that to market an autobiography. You can actually write up like the truncated version of that and try to release it on like Slate or a blog, try to pitch editors, try to you know pitch people that publish things. And I can't tell you offhand who does this for autobiographies. That would be research. Uh, but you can certainly write an article that has a sort of mini version of that story. And if that story draws a lot of attention and a lot of positive feedback and a lot of shares, if it goes viral, as the kids say, um, then you can certainly justify like in a note mm -hmm. to like a professional publisher, like a big publishing house, like, Hey, you know, we released this article, it gained this much attention. There's clearly a market for this. Um, you know, how would you feel about taking me on? Like, and you would get an agent. If you want to go the self-publishing route, the self-publishing route is really easy. Um, you, any, any asshole can make an Amazon Kindle book. I know because I'm an asshole who's done it several times. And so <laughs> you can absolutely just publish on Kindle or publish on like any ebook platform of your choice. The problem is eyeballs. And the way to get eyeballs is you either have to have a really unique and compelling story or conversely, you have to have some aspect that really instructs people. And I think that the best example of that is the book Choose Yourself by James Altucher. That is a book that was sold via direct response, sales pages, stuff like that. And it sold well, even though it was self-published, because his story was so good. He made a ton of money. He lost it all. He made it all again. He lost it all. Then he made it all again just by learning a bunch of different stuff and by totally changing his life. Like he nearly killed himself a few times. Like he lost his family. Like it's a compelling, powerful, emotional story. But what he does not choose yourself is not just merely tell that story. He also shares like what he learned from it and what yeah. people can learn from it and take away from it. And that applies to business, to entrepreneurship, to life, to mindset, all of it. And once you have like the lessons, well, then you can have a list of features and benefits of the book yeah. that allows you to sell it. Yeah. So to me, I think that's a great point. Like the, why should anyone care about this person's story is something you need to articulate very well, particularly if it ends on a down note, like, is it a cautionary tale from this person's perspective? Um, you can maybe sell off that. Um, the other thing is depending on, if this person was famous or not, there are like some more um, modern uh, like opportunities you have here. Like you can go pitch, like, I don't know exactly who your demographic is, but if there is like a media outlet that part that like has your target audience by the teeth, you know, you could do a traditional sponsorship thing with them where you pay them to like do a sponsored article. Um, if there, you could do like podcast mentions or some sort of like equivalent thing for the age group we're talking about. Like you can actually pay people to, um, advertise this to the specific audience you want, if you know who that is, um, if they were at all culturally re relevant. Um, I don't know. There's, there's, there's a lot of stuff you could do here. Just it really depends on who this person was and, yeah. um, and how the autobiography is written and what the focus yeah. is. And yeah, because here's the thing, like you'll, you'll see that this is a very common trope. Like I, I've seen a number of people say, oh, I would never listen to X person because they lost all their money. Um, but the stories that sell are the people who lost all their money, figured out what that feels like. You know, it humbles them. It brings them down to earth mm -hmm. and like makes them relatable. And then they make all that money again. What that implies, what it insinuates is that this person clearly has knowledge, clearly has something that the reader doesn't, which is some knowledge or some network or some ability that the reader wants mm -hmm. and wants to learn from. Mm -hmm. If the story is, I was rich and then I became poor. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. not going to appeal to a whole lot of people. That's just, you know, that just makes this person feel like somebody who's not going to be very trustworthy or worth listening to, especially when it comes to matters of money and success. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's if you look at any biopic or story of people that like 
you know, I had it all and then I lost it all. There's always some win or grand, grander success at the end because you have to have an arc. It can't just be like the bottom part of an arc. It can't be a Kafka story. A Kafka <laughs> plot is, and then it got worse, and then it got worse, and then it got worse, and then it got worse. And here's the thing. Kafka stories are very funny because of that subversion of our expectations. That doesn't work for an autobiography. <laughs> Unless it's like written incredibly well, like I might read a Kafka esque autobiography if it's just like the most ridiculous shit ever. And then I did math. <laughs> yeah, it, it's and then I died. <laughs> that, that's it. That's going to be the end of everybody's story. Mm -hmm. That's why I say that there's no actual W or L in anybody's life. Like I always push back against the notion that there are wins and losses because there's nothing. At the end of all of our lives, there is only one great waiting L. Oblivion. Oblivion. So a reason spell with an L. <laughs> there you go. So enough right. existential dread. <laughs> existential dread on a Wednesday. Is there ever enough? Um, Warren says, true up, picture hanging solution. This great. is my client's current Shopify page. Our goal is to optimize it for conversions then create a facebook ad and run traffic to a new page there's a lot of low-hanging fruit from what i can tell thanks for sharing your insights so i think the implication here is that he wants us to do his homework for him yes should we I mean, it is warren after all it is Warren. we love warren we do Except love warren warren still hasn't done his homework for me that he was supposed to do like two mm. months ago so then again i don't know if we should be doing his homework Warren. Warren, if you're watching this, I'm coming after you. <laughs> All right. First off, improve your loading times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the low-hanging fruit number <laughs> one, which is if your page doesn't load within seven seconds, you got to change that page. It's not working. That, that's when a marketing and design and operational problem becomes a copy problem. Because guess what? Nobody's going to buy your copy if nobody can get to your copy. Wow. This is incredible. Uh, yeah. It, it loaded instantly for me on mine. So maybe just refreshers. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Trueuphanging.com. Is that the right link? You have? Yeah. Is seven seconds a low bar or a high bar? Because low most pages bar, sorry, cannot most pages cannot get that below seven seconds. Here, I can um, I can share my screen. Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> um, share screen. True up hanging solutions. Cool. Sure. All right. Hey. Here we are. Instant pop up. Um. Get 10% off your first order, email, first name, last name, subscribe, sign up for a newsletter above. Okay. Uh, instant comment for that. And I'm going to widen my screen so I can actually see what oh. you are looking at. Yeah. Okay. Pop-ups. Put a delay on that, either a scroll delay or a time delay, so that mm -hmm. people can actually look at your copy and be like, oh, there's stuff here. And not immediately go, oh, this is annoying. And click off. Yeah. Um, another thing, too, is... If you're writing pop-up copy, um, have, you know, make sure that your headline for that pop-up abides by the four U's and make sure that since this is a home page, you have to articulate so ultra specifically what this actually is. Yeah. So get 10% off your first order is not going to appeal to people who have just heard about TrueUp and just landed on this page and don't really know what the product is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's my thing too. It's like, I need to at least know, like, I would ideally like to see the product before I get served a coupon for it, but also I need to at least know I'm on the right website. Um, and real quick, uh, what browser are you using, Sean? I'm using Chrome. Okay, I'm also using Chrome, so probably not a Chrome problem. Okay. Here, I know exactly what happened. Here, I just tried to open the page, but mm -hmm. like had the, uh, the browser window maximized. Mm -hmm. So for streaming, I had the, the window the browser window cut in half where I had one browser window with StreamYard, one browser mm -hmm. window with the website, and it didn't load for that. So yeah, maybe optimize your page a little bit better. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. Um, so 
True. Uh, future of wall hanging is here. Okay. Great. Um, That's what I, I literally ran screaming naked out of my room this morning, morning, like asking for that. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is like, okay. It's definitely just a me thing, but like, the future of anything hanging is not something I, you know, feel super great about. <laughs> like, that, like the, 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 the hang, I think it was the hanging solution. Like, I, I know literally this is about hanging, but like, there's got to be a different. There's got to be a different word. <laughs> I, I listen. If you guys want to talk about privilege, <laughs> I, and... okay, okay, look at this. <laughs> The true of hanging solution, I mean, the, basically the true hanging solution, we're quite close to the final hanging solution. I mean, like... Oh, my God. Like, like look. <laughs> Rod, only you, only you get to make these kinds of comments. And I, know, <clears throat> I know rebranding is a pain in the ass, but, like, really? Really? Okay. Anyway. Anyway. Back to I, our... Um, that didn't even occur work. to me. Uh, that's just an example of, like... Yeah, you know, <laughs> maybe get some non-white people in there. I think um, maybe I'm just particularly morbid. Probably most people wouldn't think about that. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, Until they hopefully. Do. Well, fair. So, I mean, if you're true up people, if you're watching this, your copy is a reference to lynching. Yep. <laughs> and, and and notice, I mean, at least the people they're hanging are are not black. But like, imagine if they were all black. God. That joke would have landed even better. I, I can't even with you right now. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Lost it. Oh, Lost I'm going to cry. I'm crying. Oh, my God. Ron, this is really funny and really dark. In I mean, more ways than one, like two ways. It's <laughs> extra dark. Oh my god! Okay, we need to actually be professional. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Warren, right. <clears throat> get your hanging people in check. Um. So cool. So first, shop three pack. Shop six pack. Eh. I don't know what 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 is this. I guess we have this image here. Maybe we can assume people look, but I don't really know. What does it do? Is it a magnet? Do I want three? Do I need six? Yeah. How many? Uh, shop now is good enough. You don't want to bifurcate your your CTAs. I would yeah. also try to have above the fold some explanation of like what, it is. what I'm looking at. Because right now, from watching the GIF, like I kind of intuit it and kind of understand, but like... Mm -hmm. You know, as you can see from my browser window, not everybody is going to be able to load this GIF particularly well. So, welcome yeah. to Western Wednesday. Yeah, uh, that's uh, the unique selling proposition of copy that we will make all the jokes that people are not willing to make. Look, it's just a fun little hangout. No big deal. Oh God. <laughs> ah, that was good. All right. All right. Anyway, uh, yeah, one common thing you can do here big title value not value like eye catchy benefit under explanation of what the thing is yeah. easy um all right then we get to a breakdown of what the thing is um the true up hanging solution a final solution for home decor products it adapts God damn it, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry you're right the final solution <laughs> <laughs> Those jokes. <laughs> oh, okay, right. So, um, adapts to virtually any frame is perfect for hanging up wall art up to eight pounds. You'll find everything you need for easy, precise, and nail free installations. The kit includes all these pieces. Um, yeah, that my immediate reaction to that is feels complicated and difficult. Like, hammer and nail, all you need is a hammer and nail, you know. It already feels very simple. So what is, you know, the, the components piece, you might want to keep for the mechanism a little bit later. 
and instead like talk more about like either the benefits or show some social proof or show some testimonials from people that immediately display like what the benefit mm. of this product is rather than like all the finicky bits that you're going to have to contend with the moment you buy it. Yeah. So I, I, and I think um, they still haven't demonstrated why you need this over, you know, traditional solutions because like if, so they have like this great thing with this picture here. Imagine if here, instead of this, it's a picture of someone taking a picture frame off a wall and seeing all of like the nail holes in the wall and being, being aghast and oh my God, this is so ugly now. And then go to, you know, yeah, nails ruin your walls and you shouldn't have to use them to hang out photos. Yeah, it's basic Caldini stuff. Like comparison. Comparison yeah. is one of the most fundamentally powerful modes of persuasion yeah. show like have you ever had to patch a hole just show like what you know hammering a bunch of nails into a wall can do versus like what the true up hanging solution can do yeah. and that immediately is going to show you clearly the difference and that could even be a facebook ad so mm. yeah um one kind of like genre that does this really well to me are like infomercials where they'll have like the before they even show you the product they'll have like don't you hate when or like they'll show the person chopping vegetables just unreasonably poorly and like they'll like do the knife and they'll like they'll chop off their hand it's like grayed out they'll have like the big like red circle with the line through it over it like they just make it it's so over the top but it works it's very very effective so when they cut to the product in use you're like oh that does look so much easier it's not gray there's an entire subreddit dedicated to that. Did you know that? I did not. Yeah, it's basically like people in infomercials like failing at doing the most basic, fundamental oh, yeah. human living things. I have the seen most that one. egregious example that I've ever seen was an infomercial for the Snuggie, when mm -hmm. somebody was like struggling to put a regular ass blanket. On. Yeah, it's called uh, <laughs> "Where Did the Soda Go?" Where did people the soda go? So yeah, um, it, use comparisons. That's going to be very powerful. Leave the finicky mechanism stuff for a little bit later. Really, the thing that I want to see at the very beginning of this page is like, what the hell this is mm -hmm. and why it's good and more beneficial than like the simple process of hammering a nail into a wall. Yeah. And that should be easy to do. Super easy. Um, yeah. Should so, I like... answer this question? Because I have a feeling it's a setup for a kiss my ass joke. Oh, uh, what's Kizma? Kizma, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No. Very funny black hoodie guy. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I love having a platform. <laughs> we get to joke. That's it. For the, for the brief period, period of time, we will be allowed to have it. Yeah, right. <laughs> we will get cancer one day. Uh, how often is copy reviewed if we join the Patreon? We try to do this one like a couple of times a month. Um, recently we've been crazy busy and so we haven't been able to do it every single Wednesday, but if you go to our YouTube channel and then go into the live section, you will see very clearly that we've done this a lot and we will try to get to your copy. We do have a backlog and a problem with like having that backlog, but the purpose of doing this is so that everybody can learn from it. Mm. So, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's anyway. look at more of this copy and then we will move on. Yeah, so next we got a little value stack thing. Easy, fast, flexible, true. Uh, um, I don't know what true means, but sure. The, so the flexible one, that's an, a great example of like something like that's a single bullet. How cool mm -hmm. would it be to actually do a demonstration of that? Like literally like yeah. you mount a picture on the wall and, you know, it cuts to a person who's like, and then the person takes the picture down and like within just a matter of seconds is able to take true up and put it on a different wall and mm -hmm. hang the picture. And the person's like, <laughs> and the caption for that is just very simply like, you know, reuse your mounts within seconds. Mm -hmm. And the, here, another idea comes to mind, like how long does it take for a person on average to, hang a level picture versus how long does it take to install true up if true up actually installs faster bingo bango you can say you know 37 percent faster than a hammer and nail 
that's powerful. Yeah. And less likely to destroy your thumb. There you go. There you go. Don't get nailed hanging up photos. <sighs> Stop with the brand agency nonsense. <laughs> All you do is just sit around and come up with clever crap. <laughs> Tired of getting nailed? <laughs> Oh, Rod, I love you. But yeah, true, our built-in level makes every project Mm. picture perfect. I don't know if true is what I would use there. And what is project picture perfect? This doesn't mean anything. Let's be real. You just wanted four. Yeah, that's true. And secondly, but that's actually pretty cool. That's a cool, that's an example of like how the actual mechanism of the product can be used to as a differentiator mm-hmm. as a potential angle unto itself yeah but you know the only way to hang pictures that automatically levels things for you yeah. done that's great so um so we have a little order form next i feel like this page is not doing everything that it could be doing to do particularly well yeah um, it, it gets crazier though. So the next, it tells you what it is. Oh, great. I, what I wonder is like, do you, th- I wonder if they drive people directly to this page from other ads and that talk about what it is. And so then they say, here's like explaining what it is, yeah. whatever, straight to order form. Cause if, if that's the case, this makes more, like, it makes more sense. It's still bad, but I, I would get it a little bit more. I think that's what Warren implied that they were going to do Facebook ads to this. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. again, that makes the structure make a little bit more sense, but it doesn't absolve everything. I also think that there's too much copy there for the, what is true up. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, but also I love this quote. Where happiness can exist while hanging pictures. And doesn't she just look so happy too? <laughs> she's like blanky in morse code please send help <laughs> like when i imagine what it's like to be happy hanging pictures like this 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 is the fa- this is the face oh you catty bitch <laughs> <laughs> and, and to be clear i'm casting no shade at this woman but just like the oh. quote with this is like in this really kind of like grayed out lighting like really this is what happiness looks like and like, did and is it the case currently that happiness cannot exist in other picture hanging scenarios? It cannot. It cannot. Maybe, maybe, maybe we didn't need the technology to be happy while we're hanging. Maybe hanging is a really sad thing, and we should just understand that. <laughs> Warren, when you write the co- the copy for this page and you rewrite it, make sure that you emphasize like how dreary and tedious hanging things always is, and how that no joy can be experienced, but it is a character building exercise that we must all undertake. The historical tragedy of hanging. Yes. The, the, the Sisyphusian task that is hanging a picture. I'm going to play the video at our audience request. True up. Easiest way to hang every time, every time. Did he can you hear the audio? I can, I can hear the audio. Uh, can everybody else hear the audio? Hopefully. There is a, when you present, there's like certain options to present where you can share the audio versus not. Okay. If you can hear it, I assume they can hear it. So I'll just keep playing. Yes. This okay. strip will hold on approved services, but we recommend using the included true tax for a secure hold. True ups mounts are interchangeable and reusable, so you can mix and match. And if you want to hang a frame with a wire, true up includes an adapter in every package. And TrueUp's patented adhesive is designed to release when you're ready. The possibilities are limitless and it's easy on your walls. Picture hanging can be truly a one person job. TrueUp, the future of hanging is here. <laughs> breathe, buddy. Breathe. <laughs> Oh no. You have to breathe. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> <laughs> but 
can also follow us on Instagram. <laughs> For all your the hanging content that you've been craving. Oh, God. <sighs> Future of hanging's here, though. Oh, yeah, clearly. <laughs> I feel like okay. hanging is in our future after after this. Um, professionally speaking, I, I suppose we're not allowed to laugh at this. What mm. other word should be used? Okay. I, I, to, okay, to be very serious, um, I, I don't think hanging is, is, is the worst. I, I've just made a series of jokes about this now, and now I can't not laugh at it. Um, here, let me just reopen that page. Um, I, I think all the word that we usually use is mounting, like you you mount a photo, um, which has its other connotations. But I think in the context of walls, maybe it's a little bit you know, it's more specific. Um, we could talk, yeah, mounting photos, placing photos. We're talking about home de home decor, decorations. You know, there are, there are lots of ways to get at that. I just sometimes using the word hanging in a a very blunt way or clumsy way can feel a little bit jarring um, yeah. for some people, given the history of that word in this country. Um, I don't think that you can't use the word hanging in your copy, and I think that most of the cases in which they use it are not unreasonable. I just, I was perhaps not particularly generous, um, especially when they we're talking about the future of hanging is, is now. It's good to have uncharitable readings because there's always going to be somebody out there in the market who has an uncharitable reading of your copy. And you have to be kind of ready for it. You have to accept that, like, some people are going to read your copy and read the wrong things into it and come up mm. with very bad opinions about the product or you as a yeah. person. And that's just inevitable. Um, and so you have to take things with, a, you know, the knowledge that sometimes... Mm. Either you have to roll with it anyway and like be okay with that, or conversely, that it might be worth finessing a little bit. For me, I think the biggest problem with this page and the biggest problem with the way that this product is being marketed is that it is so focused on the actual product itself yeah. and not the outcome that you get. Why do people hang art or pictures on their walls? Why? Very simple. Just let's ask that basic motherfucking question. Why? Everybody in the chat, let me know what you think. Why do we do this? And, and also, just to clarify, you're, you, yeah. that was actually a good you're, question. You're, you're not question. being a by asking that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and, and particularly at agencies, and when the bigger the company you're working with, the more people are going to be worried about those kinds of interpretations, which is why the copy you see come out of large brands tends to be pretty generic or, you know, not particularly caustic. Yeah. Yeah. So because pretty, that's a, you know, superficial way of understanding it. Absolutely. Like, yeah, it's an aesthetic choice. It adds mm. aesthetics. And also guess what's attached to what we consider to be aesthetic, typically memories, it makes your life less dull. It creates decoration and to remember the past. When you post a poster on your wall, like you, you get a, like a concert poster framed and then you hang it on your wall. You're not just posting that up on your wall because you think it looks cool. Like I'm sure some people do. You're doing that because of the connection, the mm. emotional connection you have to the environment that you want to surround yourself with. Yeah. So when you are talking about hanging pictures on your wall, you're you're not talking about, oh, great. Well, I can hang more pictures now and it's easier. No, we're talking about making it easier for you to look at and remember your daughter's childhood. We're talking about allowing people to remember a time when you know maybe they were a punk rocker as a teenager and now all of a sudden they're actually able to like you know the, the corporate there's stuff like that but they'll always have that memory they'll always have that concert poster the picture of them with like sid vicious or something like that that's mm -hmm. worth hanging and I'm, I'm bringing this up just so that people who come in uh, understand the context of what we're talking about yeah when you hang something on your wall it is not merely just to hang something on your wall. 
people have a deep, deep connection. The same way that people have a deep connection to the tattoos they put on their body or the clothes that they wear or the things that they, you know, you know the brands that they aso associate with. It's often, uh, I, I think of that um, Madman, uh, Madman uh, scene, you know, the one I'm talking about, the carousel. Mm -hmm. It's not, what we're talking about is not a way to look at pictures. We are talking about a way to transport ourselves into the past. And if you don't understand the emotional aspect of that, then this product is not going to sell particularly well because ultimately what is it? It's a 3M wall stick. Like that that tech, 3M makes that. And then what they've done is add a leveler to it and tax and a magnet. That's yeah. it. And so ultimately what we're talking about, it's not something that's like crazy scientific. Again, 3M made this stuff a decade ago. So what we're talking about is the outcome, what people hope to get emotionally from using this product. Yeah. So, and Warren asks, no, that's the one hanging joke that Rod has not made yet. Yeah. And it's, it's not a benefit kind of argument. Um, mm -hmm. Let me, let me try to explain really quick. When you're looking at a product, and you're looking at the characteristics of the product, there are four four levels that every copywriter needs to understand and know. And I'll eventually have a masterclass about this. Features, advantages, benefits, and deeper benefits. Now, features are what you see on this page currently. Like, if you scroll down, Rod, a little bit. Um, uh, I think you're sharing right now, actually. Oh, oh my God, it actually worked. Okay, yeah. so this is this is, I finally got it to work. These are the features. It has an ad adhesive for mounts. And when you have the kit, it includes wall mounts. That's a feature. There you go. What is the benefit? Uh, well, sorry, what is the advantage? Well, right now there are no advantages on this page, but you would want to show an advantage of this system over slamming a nail into your wall. That would be an advantage. What is a benefit? <laughs> benefit is it's virtually any frame is perfect for hanging wall art up. So You'll find everything you need easy, precise, and nail-free. Those are benefits. So those are features and easy, that more conceptual notion outside of the actual physical components of the product, that's a benefit. Deeper benefits are the emotional aspect of a product, the things, the outcomes, and the components of a product that connect to something much more resonant, much deeper. A really good example um, that I saw in a Dan Kennedy speech relatively recently was hearing aids. Now, here's mm -hmm. the thing. What are, what are the features of a hearing aid? It allows you to hear. What are the advantages of a hearing aid? I don't know. Maybe the battery life lasts longer. What are the benefits of a hearing aid? Well, it uh, allows you to actually like enjoy bird song or in, like enjoy like music again. Okay, but what are deeper benefits for somebody that needs a hearing aid? I'll give you a very specific example. When old people get above a certain age, hearing loss and the effects that that has on your personality because you can't freaking hear anything it begins to look indistinguishable from dementia and so a lot of older people are terrified of being put into an assisted living home guess what the deeper benefit of a hearing aid is then it is not merely you get to hear stuff it's guess what a lot of people when they start to lose their hearing show are showing signs of early dementia if you want to avoid getting put into a home, you need a hearing aid. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another deeper benefit. A lot of grandparents, parents, and this is a survey that was done, don't trust grandparents to watch children if they can't hear them, especially young kids. And so how does that make you feel as an elderly person that your own children do not trust you with your own grandchildren? because of your hearing that's a deeper benefit so this goes well beyond what's in it for me this goes into like the actual like yearning deep deep yearning that everybody has the the thing that people crave that is beyond the physical product yeah 
I, I actually, or sorry, go ahead. So after you, after you. Um, okay. Um, so I actually have some good language for this that I was, it's so funny. Yesterday I was talking to someone who doesn't work uh, on Nike, but was like, we're talking about making Nike ads and they were saying like, oh, I don't even play sports. I feel like I couldn't do this very well. And I think the thing that ends up being true for all advertising is that there are certainly product truths, like things about what the product is or what it literally unlocks when you use it or whatever. But then there are also human truths. And these are things that are about the deeper sort of human experience. They could certainly be things like, um, you know, not being classified as having dementia or feeling more free, feeling more independent, whatever. Um, but also things like the sort of sense of pride that you experience when you do something on your own for the first time. Um, what it means to you to be able to keep doing something you've done your entire life, what it feels like when you overcome adversity, you're able to do something people said that you'd never be able to do. You can, if you are able to, if you're a human and if you understand what those emotions are, you can write good advertising for anything. If you develop the skill of tracking from those product truths, what that product is like literally doing to what does this mean for us? Like on an existential level. Um, and so I, I think that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. Um, in the video, as funny as the ending was that moment where they're kind of like moving these frames around and like kind of customizing what that looks like, what that setup looks like. I think there is really big potential there to, you know, talk about how you can kind of like change what your aesthetic, what your moment is based on your mood. And so if today you're feeling more like, I don't know, happy and shit, maybe you could have sunflowers and stuff, or the next day you're doing punk rock, or maybe your wall looks one way most of the time, but you know, your veteran husband is coming home. And so you're going to put up all your marriage or family photos or something and American flags and shit. And it's this big emotional moment, yada, yada, yada. Having that sort of like flexibility to talk about your full range of experience that it's not just the product being flexible. Now your ability to express like your love and care and compassion and human experience has become more flexible as a result of the product. Um, and so there's like a huge range of stuff you can do there. Yeah, I was actually talking to Chris Adad about this very subject. Uh -huh. You know, uh, we were talking about like the role of empathy in advertising. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody said something and Chris Adad was like just affronted by this. And he was just like, the way you get at deeper benefits, the way you understand your audience is by being a fucking human being, mm -hmm. like looking deeper inside you. Oh, are you are you meandering through the. Uh, these are the offices of W and K. Yeah, there's Here. a big uh, pirate ship behind me. Nice. We yeah, we decorate everything for Halloween. Guys, this is what the inside of a, an ad agency looks like. Yeah. Got a big uh -oh. atrium area. Uh, I am walking to a meeting, so I'm probably just going to hang up in like about 30 seconds, so you can keep talking. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have to go to my uh, okay. wife and kids just walked in the door. Okay. Um, so really quick, just to put a pin in everything that I was saying, no, that is not dimensionalization. Dimensionalization is just describing something one way and then adding another dimension to it. Um, I have a whole report on dimensionalization in the Patreon. Uh, we send it for free to our email list. Um, hey. I recommend everybody study that. Um, how does one go about finding deep benefits out? Search inside, also interview your customers. Uh, this is not Nike headquarters. This is W and K in Portland, and we are having a meetup on the pirate boat. Fairly, <laughs> not that kind of meetup though. Spelled correctly. So, um, I think that that is going to be a what's on Wednesday. I have to go. Oh, I see that my daughter has fallen asleep. So okay. maybe I have some time with this. But Rod, you have All to right. go to a meeting. Um, yep. Dude, right. it was. I'm glad that you were able to join. Yes, it's always wonderful. Um, I will catch you later. Toodles, guys. Everybody, have a wonderful day, and we will get to more of the copy that has been submitted sometime soon. Take care. Have a wonderful day.